as our amazing FDNY and NYPD responded to a helicopter crash that took place in Councilmember Powers District in Midtown. And while some of the details are still under investigation, the pilot, Timothy McCormick, sadly lost his life. Monday's crash shook many of us to the core and brought up memories of 9-11. New Yorkers will never forget that day. The same cannot be said about our federal government. Once again, we have to beg Congress to authorize funding for the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund. I want to thank Luis Alvarez, a retired NYPD detective and 9-11 first responder, about to begin his 69th round of chemotherapy. His 69th round of chemotherapy for liver cancer that he developed because of his service to our city in the days after our country was attacked. And I want to thank John Stewart and all of those who testified these past few days about the importance of this funding when they testified down in Washington. I also want to thank the entire New York congressional delegation. It has been a bipartisan effort to get this funding. This body knows how important this funding is. Every stated meeting, we name the first responders that we have lost due to 9-11 illnesses. And once again, once again today, while they are holding up the money for the heroes who sacrifice so much, today, since our last stated meeting on May 29th, we have learned seven more first responders have died Seven in two weeks. These brave individuals, James Boyle and Thomas Waterman, who were both members of the NYPD, and they were among the first people to arrive at Ground Zero when the towers were attacked. Michael O'Sullivan and Maria Elena diaz Quintero were members of the Department of Sanitation and day after day supported 9-11 recovery efforts. John Ballum passed away at the age of 67 years old. He was a paramedic at St. Vincent's Hospital in Greenwich Village and responded that day and in the days after to help those who were recovering. Captain Thomas Kenny served as part of the Hyannis Fire Department for more than 36 years, and he was a responder for numerous disasters, including 9-11. He was 65 years old. And William James Leahy, a Port Authority police officer for 27 years. He was 49 years old. I am angry and I am sad that we cannot get this funding. It needs to be permanent funding so that these families and victims and those who are recovering can get the money they deserve without being re-traumatized, without having to go down to Washington and beg when they were the heroes that served our country on 9-11 and in the days and weeks and months afterwards. It is the right thing to do. Looks like the House is going to pass this legislation in the coming weeks, and I hope that the U.S. Senate will immediately follow and pass a permanent fix until 2090 so that all victims are compensated and that their health care is taken care of for the rest of their lives. I'm also very sad to say that we also lost two very highly respected, long-serving members of the NYPD since our last stated both tragically died by suicide. Detective Joseph Calabrese was 58 years old and he had served in the NYPD since 1982, 37 years on the force. And Deputy Chief Stephen Silks, who many council members from Queens know, served his community in Queens on the NYPD for 39 years. He was 62 years old. This was incredibly painful and tough for the entire police department and our thoughts 
are with their friends, their families, and their colleagues. Lastly, I am saddened to have to share the news that former city council staffer and district leader Kevin Peter Carroll passed away on June 3rd. Many of us knew Kevin for his dedication to his community and his passion for politics. Kevin worked with council member Steve Levin on behalf of Brooklyn for seven years and he was a member of Brooklyn Community Board 10. He was 33 years old. My office has details on the services for Kevin, so you can please talk to any member of the staff if you would like to get those details. I want to ask everyone to rise and have a moment of silence and all of those we've honored and to these dedicated service men and women and civil servants who have done so much for our city. Thank you all. On a more positive note, I want to acknowledge that it's June, which means that it is Pride Month. This is a very special Pride Month because it is 50 years since the Stonewall Uprising and we are the proud hosts of World Pride. I can't begin to say how much this personally means to me and I will say that I am completely aware of the hard work of all of those activists who came before me and all of us to allow us to be able to serve helping the next generation. It's our duty to help the next generation that's gonna come after us. And I know I say that on behalf of council members Torres and Van Bramer and Menchaca and Drum as well. Before we get started with today's agenda, I'd also like to take a minute to acknowledge the departure of one of our great and wonderful and key and just, just very, very wonderful staff members, Elizabeth Guzman. Elizabeth has been with the Office of the General Counsel since December of 2016, serving as counsel to the Rules Committee, as our parliamentarian, and as a trusted counsel to all members and to staff. Elizabeth, I don't know what she was thinking, but she is moving on to support the Office of the Public Advocate in a similar role as General Counsel. I'm joking, Jumani. Uh, we're very proud of her and we're very happy for Jumani as well. Elizabeth will be dearly missed for the levity that she has brought to stressful situations, for her legal acumen that she has brought to complex issues, and uh, I am sure you will all join me in thanking Elizabeth for her incredible service, and we are really grateful that she's staying in government to work with our former colleague and our great public advocate, Jumani Williams, so I'd love to give Elizabeth Guzman a big round of applause. Congratulations. Uh, lastly, we've all said it, but it's important to say it again. We welcome the council's newest member, Councilmember Farrell Lewis, who is representing the 45th Council District. We are so happy to have you here. Congratulations. Uh, now we're going to dive into today's agenda. Today, the council will vote on 20 Article 11 property tax exemptions out of the Finance Committee. The exemption applications are within my district and the districts of council members Cabrera, Ayala, Gibson, Perkins, Reynoso, Torres, King, Cohen, and Joan I. Collectively, the projects that are receiving Article 11 exemptions to support either the new construction or preservation of 2,059 units of affordable housing throughout Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens, and all of the council members that I listed in the relevant districts are supportive of these actions. I want to thank the staff, Stephanie Ruiz and Noah Brick, for their work on this. The council will vote on the site selection of four new schools. Excuse me. The first is a 650-seat intermediate school in Councilmember Carlos Menchaca's district. The second is a 458-seat primary school in Councilmember Rafael Salamanca's district. The third is a 458 primary school in Councilmember Vanessa Gibson's district. And the fourth is a 592 
uh, Intermediate School uh, in Councilmember Justin Brannon District. The council will vote on the following land use actions, Manhattanville Walkway in Councilmember Levine's District, Brownsville North Ocean Hill NCP Cluster in Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuels District, and the JFK North Site in Councilmember Donovan Richards' District. We'll be voting on the following affordable housing preservation projects, the Lenox Avenue Cluster in Councilmember Perkins' District, East Harlem El Barrio CLT in Councilmember Ayala and Perkins' District, Cloth Cluster and Council Member Levine Perkins and Rodriguez's district. And I want to thank the staff who worked on these land use projects. Uh, John Douglas, Amy Leviton, and Jeff Yoon, and today is Amy Leviton's birthday, so happy birthday, Amy. Moving on, the council will vote on the following piece of legislation. First, I want to congratulate Councilmember Justin Brannon uh, on introduction uh, 826A, which would expand reporting requirements to provide the public with more information related to the use of life-saving technologies in serious fires. The bill expands existing reporting requirements related to smoke alarms or detectors to to now include reporting following all fires that cause a civilian fatality or life-threatening injury. Additionally, the bill requires new reporting on the presence and activation of automatic sprinkler systems at the location of each serious fire incident where the department deploys more than three fire engines. Congratulations, council member. And I want to thank the staff, Josh Kingsley, uh, Robert Calandra, and Rachel Cordero for their work on this bill. Next, introduction. 732B by Councilmember Ben Kalos would establish what is often referred to as a full public match, wherein all participating candidates could reach their expenditure limit using only matchable contributions and public funds. This public fund match would be available to participating candidates who select option A for the 2021 elections, and starting in 2022, it will be uh, required of all participating candidates. Additionally, the bill amends the act to incorporate relevant portions of ballot question one as approved by the voters in 2018 by moving them out of the charter and into the administrative code. It would also adjust dates, deadlines, and requirements within the act to reflect the earlier June primary date, which was established by state law earlier this year, and finally it removes language that has previously sunset or otherwise been mooted. This would be a big step for campaign finance and making public office more accessible for any people who want to run for office. And I want to thank the staff, Brad Reed, Daniel Collins, Emily Forgione, Elizabeth Cronk, and Sebastian Bakke. Introduction 799 by our public advocate, Jumani Williams, would clarify that retaliation is prohibited where an individual requests a reasonable accommodation under the city's human rights law. And I want to thank the staff, Balkis Mirig and Leah Skirpiak for their work on that bill. Next, we have a series of bills related to incarcerated individuals, including two from Councilmember Keith Powers. The first, Introduction 1236A, is intended to improve access to care. Introduction 1236 a would require the Department of Correction to publish a report on data pertaining to protection for scheduled medical appointments. It would also require the department to retain all records having to do with last minute sick call appointments and would ensure that incarcerated individuals have access to sick call five days per week, excluding holidays. And the next bill by Councilmember Powers, the chair of our Criminal Justice Committee, is Introduction 1370A, which would streamline the intake process for grievances and improve access. It would ensure that all complaints made through and one are addressed through the grievance process. It would also require all third-party complaints to be addressed through this process. It would ensure that the department informs every incarcerated individual in writing about the grievance process and about protections against retaliation. It would also require the department to include grievance forms, including appeals forms, on its website. I want to congratulate Councilmember Powers on these two important pieces of legislation. I want to thank the staff, Alana Sivan and Brian Crow, for their work on these bills, and they worked on the other bills we're discussing as well. Uh, next is, in, is introduction 1340 by Councilmember Diana Ayala, which will make the grievance process more efficient by requiring the Department of Corrections to create a central system where it can track all complaints and appeals and give regular access to the board to such a system. It would also ensure greater access to the grievance process by requiring at least one grievance box to be placed in each facility and by requiring caseload guidelines for grievance coordinators. The law will also require the DOC to install electronic complaint kiosks by 2026. 
and are related uh, to the grievance process uh, bills that we're talking about is introduction 1334A by Councilman Berlika Ampri Samuel, which would require the Board of Corrections to issue a report at least every three years on issues related to the department's grievance process. This report would incorporate direct feedback from incarcerated individuals and proposed recommendations for relevant improvements. The bill requires the report to include a section of recommendations on how to improve the grievance process for vulnerable populations, including incarcerated individuals who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, or gender non-conforming. And on these bills, I want to congratulate Councilmember Ayala and Councilmember Amprey Samuel on these really important pieces of this corrections package. So congratulations, Diana and Alika. Finally, we have two bills related to art on city-owned property. One comes from Councilmember Inez Barron, introduction 1114A, which will create a task force to study and issue recommendations regarding monuments, statues, public art, and historical markers on city-owned property. Those works that have been subject to sustained negative attention or may be viewed as inconsistent with the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion will be prioritized for review. I really want to congratulate Councilmember Barron for her really hard work and thoughtfulness uh, on this. She's talked about some of the examples that we've had where we had had to make uh, choices and saying this is not acceptable anymore. So I want to congratulate you on putting forward this legislation. I look forward to working together. An introduction 1439A sponsored by Councilmember Rafael Salamanca would require the Public Design Commission to establish a goal that at least 50% of the non-fictional persons represented in new works of art be women. It would also require the Public Design Commission to advise and provide strategies to city agencies on how to increase diversity of rep representation in city artwork. And on these two bills, I want to thank the staff, Brenda McKinney, Aliyah Ali, Smita Deshmukh, and Andrea Vasquez. That concludes our agenda for today's stated meeting, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now I have a discussion on general orders. Councilman Michaelos. Thank you. I want to wake up in a city with a government that actually works for New Yorkers, affordable housing, amazing schools, and a transit system that actually gets you where you need to go. Now, 2021 is a worst nightmare for me and every other renter in the city of New York. There's 38 council members, five borough presidents, the controller and the mayor all termed out of office. And I shudder to think what big money can try to do to elect a government that would work for them instead of the communities they represent. When I ran in 2013, I didn't take money from real estate. I was mocked and ridiculed to my face. Who knows what people said behind my back? Everyone said real estate runs this town. I was offered more money than I could ever imagine from real estate. I was told to take it if I wanted a future in politics. I chose not to work for real estate, instead to work for my community. I didn't let a broken system corrupt me, and today we changed the system to work for New Yorkers. With the support of 1.1 million people who voted in favor of November for proof that it worked uh, when we applied it to the public advocates race, and we've already elected the first citywide elected official without real estate money. Uh, and uh, we thank him for overseeing today's uh, proceedings. Going forward, we will match every small dollar with eight public dollars to reduce the corrupting influence of big money in favor of amplifying the voices of residents. I want to have a special thank you to my co-prime sponsor and governmental operations chair, Fernando Cabrera, who sponsored it last term. Uh, my new co-prime sponsor, the, the new reformer on the block, Keith Powers and Brad Lander, as well as staff, Rob Newman, Brad Reed, Daniel Collins, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forgione, and Sebastian Bocci and central staff for their work on this bill. And last but not least, one clarification, this will apply to, uh, 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 this, this will not apply for funds rolling in. This only applies to funds that folks have raised in this system. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Thank you. I want to just speak briefly on intro 1114A, which talks about establishing a task force that would look at the monuments and markers that we have on public property in our city. So for those who 
may recall some Bible stories, we know that when Joshua led the Israelites across the Jordan, he was told to have them collect stones and put them there so that generations coming afterwards would say, well, what's the meaning of these stones? Why are they here? And we know that Samuel, when he was victorious in battle, had a huge monument erected so that people would remember the victory at that place that God had helped them. So when we take monuments and markers and put them up in our city, it calls people's attention to stop and wonder, who is that? Why is that marker there? Why is this an important person or an event to be commemorated by the city? And we believe that there are numerous monuments around this city that are not deserving of having people emulate them or call positive attention to them because their history is riddled with injustices to people that have existed or they don't reflect the diversity of our culture or the they don't have the equitable representation for different kinds of people and they're not inclusive. So this task force would address that issue. It would be chaired by the um, Commissioner of Cultural Affairs or the Executive Director of the Art Commission. And it would include the Commissioner of City Planning, Parks and Recreation, Transportation, and would have seats on the task force for members from each of the boroughs. And those members would be selected based on their expertise in history, art and antiquities, public art and public space, preservation, cultural heritage, diversity and inclusion or education. So I'm urging all of my colleagues to vote aye. And I want to thank all the persons who were involved in preparing this legislation and thank the speaker for his support. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate, and good afternoon, Speaker, and all of my colleagues. I just quickly wanted to speak in support of pre-considered land use item 461. Um, as the Speaker mentioned, is one of the items on today's agenda that is going to create a 458-seat elementary school in my district at 1302 EL Grand Highway in the Bronx in School District 9. And this for me is such a major accomplishment. And this council last March voted overwhelmingly in favor of the Jerome Avenue rezoning. And this was a part of that extensive package. And I am so proud because it recognizes that as this city grows, as we continue to build housing across many neighborhoods, we also have to recognize the amenities and the burden it places on our local schools, parks, playgrounds, and mass transit. And this school for us in District 9 is a recognition that our school-aged children deserve new amenities and new facilities. And because it was a privately owned site, we traveled through the district relentlessly to find a space and work with the Department of City Planning and the School Construction Authority and the Land Use Division, and this was the site that was identified. So today is such a great day for me and the district I represent, and so I'm asking all of my colleagues to please vote in favor of this and recognizing that we continue to build great schools with all the amenities that our children absolutely deserve. And with that, I want to thank our Community Education Council, District 9 in the Bronx, the Borough Office, my superintendent, the Planning Division, as well as SCA and all the stakeholders. And certainly, I want to recognize land use. Thank you to Raju, to Amy, and Jeff, who walked with me and held my hand throughout this entire process. I could not be more grateful to you. So once again, I am just asking colleagues to vote yes, and I will be voting aye on all. Thank you so much, Mr. Public Advocate. Thank you. Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Mr. President. A robust public financing program which empowers small contributors is a good thing. It's one that I participated in. It's one that many members of this body participated in. And without it, perhaps I wouldn't be here. Just seven months ago, our voters lowered the maximum contribution allowed and increased the amount of public funds available to our campaigns to 75% of the expenditure limitation or $142,000 in a council race instead of the $100,000 it had been when we ran for office. If we do nothing today, that's what it would be. $142,000 in a council race, 75% of the expenditure limitation. And this was a trade-off. Fewer larger contributions, more public funds. The intent was clear. In exchange for the taxpayers giving more public funds to campaigns, 
candidates would have to agree to take less private funds. Today's bill, Introduction 732, ignores, at least in part, what the voters enacted seven months ago. You don't have to believe me, just look at the first two paragraphs of the bill. The word repealed is there twice. Instead of receiving over $40,000 more in a council race than what was in effect when we ran, a candidate will now be able to receive $70,000 more. That might not sound like much, but in a mayoral primary, that's over a million dollars more to a candidate. And in exchange for being more generous to ourselves than the taxpayers chose to be just seven months ago, we give nothing back. We are not reducing contribution limits. We are not eliminating special interest PAC money. We are not getting rid of contributions from lobbyists. We are not getting rid of money from doing business people. We are not even getting rid of the evil real estate money. Nothing. We give nothing back. All we do is reach into the pockets of the taxpayers, take the money, put it into our campaigns. That's what this bill does. All the words mean nothing. That's what this bill does. Read the words. That's what it says. I am not sure how we look a homeless New Yorker in the eye and tell them we can't find them in an affordable place to live. I see the clock is running out, Mr. President. I'm almost done. But don't worry, we have money for our next campaign mailing. Or a child going to bed hungry and tell her that we don't know where she's getting her next meal, but we have more money for robocalls. Over 200 years ago, members of this body got together and delayed constructing this building because the construction was deemed too extravagant, unworthy of spending taxpayer funds. They delayed construction, they reduced the size of the building, they spent less money, and they got it done. I'm asking my colleagues to please be brave today. Stand up and vote no on 732. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I'm going to take some personal privilege, two minutes to uh, discuss my bill. Uh, intro 79 uh, would prohibit any retaliatory action by any employer if an employee requested a reasonable accommodation on the basis of a religious observance, disability, pregnancy, childbirth, medical condition, or their status as a victim of domestic violence, a sex offense, or stalking, among other possible reasons. There was previously no mention that protected employees from any retaliatory action by an employer in asking for the legally required required reasonable accommodations. This is one of those bills where I found it crazy that there was no existing protections. I thought it may be just closing a loophole, but we found several uh, instances where the court did not find for someone in this position. One example, in 2015, an employee requested accommodations after experiencing seizures five months after beginning work and was terminated shortly thereafter in Hernandez versus Well Wild Cornell Medical College. Rather than hear argument over whether the termination was related to her cause, the court determined that the employee could not state a retaliation claim because the act of requesting accommodation is not recognized as a protected activity. This bill will allow employees to make claims to the New York City Commission on Human Rights when employees were retaliated for asking such accommodations. In the past, many cases have been lost or stopped because there was no protection. When employees have temporarily injured themselves or pregnant or have faced domestic violence at home, their workplace should be, shouldn't be another barrier of making their lives harder. Employees should not be afraid of asking for reasonable accommodation to be more efficient workers. All employees have the right to work free of discrimination, harassment, and retaliation such as previously passed, past bills I worked on with this council, the boss bill, the DV protection bill, the veterans bill, even while I helped introduce intro 800 that provides paid personal time for all employees of New York City. <clears throat> all employees have the right to work with dignity and it's bills like these that I advocate for to create a better work environment so that New Yorkers come, become more valued and productive employees of our great city. Thank you to council Balkis Mirig, finance analyst Neven Singh, policy, policy analyst Leah Skirp Skirpiak, and thank you uh, to the chair, Council Member Eugene, and of course, the speaker for your support. I urge my colleagues to please vote aye. Council Member Levin. Um, thank you very much, Public Advocate. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the Hope Reichback Fellows for this year. Um, they are students uh, at colleges uh, around the country, including CUNY, SUNY, and Yale this year. Uh, and the Hope Reichback uh, uh, Foundation is uh, supporting internships at Brooklyn-based not-for-profits uh, where they are able to, uh, to get involved in the important issues that we all work on and support uh, those organizations being uh, Brooklyn Community Services, Brooklyn Defenders, Vocal New York, um, uh, Bed-Stuy Restoration, 
Um, and I want to acknowledge the, uh, the fellows this year, Brianna Boyce, Jordan Powell, Jonathan Elaine, uh, Gusmeri Ramirez, and Mirame Keita. Um, so thank you, and they're, they're here in the balcony. Um, and then uh, I would like to take a moment to thank the speaker um, uh, and all my colleagues for acknowledging um, the loss of Kevin Peter Carroll. Uh, Kevin uh, worked in my office uh, since 2010, uh, and he brought a real exuberance uh, to everything that he did. He uh, loved politics, uh, was very knowledgeable about uh, all things political, um, uh, really had an encyclopedic knowledge of Congress, um, and, and really truly loved um, uh, the day-to-day -day aspects of politics, of getting to know people, getting to know their issues. He was an incredibly warm individual. Um, he was very open and honest with everybody, um, and he really wore his heart on his sleeve um, in a way that was really admirable. Um, and um, I know that he enriched my life and, and the, life, the lives of, of uh, uh, my staff and countless others, um, and we are, are truly devastated uh, by, by uh, uh, his passing. And um, my heart goes out to his friends and family, um, and, uh, and, and, and we wish him um, uh, the deepest of peace and, um, and blessing and, and, and thank him for everything he did for us. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Councilman Levin, and uh, all of us uh, from Brooklyn, I'm sure, indeed, the entire council share your sentiment. May you rest in peace and power. Thank you. Council Member Cornegy. Thank you, uh, Public Advocate Williams. Uh, good afternoon. We're convening shortly after the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and I'm reminded of the bravery of our armed forces and the promise of America. If you work hard and play by the rules, you should be able to get ahead. Thankfully, lawmakers in Albany helped keep that promise by strengthening tenant and rent regulations that will affect about half of the apartments in this city. This is a huge success for the advocacy community that has fought tirelessly for years to ensure greater equity for renters. Tenants in New York continue to face the pressures of rising costs to an increasingly unaffordable housing market. Too often, tenants are forced out of their homes merely because they do not have the time or resources to combat unscrupulous landlords seeking to extract higher rents. The city and state must continue their efforts to protect and promote equity for renters and ensure that people have the opportunity to stay in and even own their homes. It's also Pride Month and the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. The day's long protests sparked a shift in the national conversation about homosexual and transgender individuals and pressed government and society to be more tolerant and accepting. Next year will be the 50th anniversary of the first Gay Pride March the first in the nation that took place right here in New York City. We commend and celebrate the 50 years of progress and want people from every background to know that no matter who you are, you belong here in New York City. I also want to call attention to some recent events in the city. First, there was a helicopter crash atop a building in Midtown that resulted in a fire. My sincerest condolences to the family of the pilot who tragically lost his life. As more information is released and investigations is completed, I will join with colleagues in pushing for whatever appropriate measures are necessary to ensure safety and avoid similar tragic events in the future. Second, I'd like to call attention to a young hero, Lucas Silverio who passed away late last night due to injuries sustained in a fire in the Belmont section of the Bronx. Lucas risked his life to save three-year-old Las Lasleen McDonald, who also tragically passed away due to sustained injuries. My heart aches for the families and loved ones impacted. Additionally, my team and I are monitoring developments on a fire this morning that tore through three homes in the Midwood section of Brooklyn. Twelve people are in the hospital, including three firefighters and a six-week-old six infant. They're in our thoughts, and we'd like to thank the FDNY and first responders for their quick and effective response to the blaze. While the cause of this fire is unclear, I'm committed to working with the council to reduce the likelihood of fires, increase preparedness, and do everything in my power to ensure incidents like these are avoided in the future. Finally, I'd like to introduce the new communications and legislative director for our office, Eddie Amador. He has a background in housing and homelessness, and we're excited to have him on board. Thank you. Thank you. A report of special committees? None. Report of standing committees? 
Report of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights, Intro 799, Reasonable Accommodation Law. A couple of general orders. Report of the Committee on Criminal Justice, Intro 1236A, Correctional Health Services. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intros 1334A, 1340A, and 1370A, Bills Affecting Incarcerated Individuals. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the, excuse me, Report of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Intro 1114A and 1439A, Art on City-Owned Property. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Finance, Preconsidered LU 439 and Reso 926 through Preconsidered LU 458 and Reso 945. 45 on page 6, tax exemptions. Couple of general orders. Report of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, intro 826A, smoke alarms and fire sprinklers. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Governmental Operations, intro 732B, full public match campaign finance system. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU 398 and Reso 946, East Harlem Land Trust. Coupled on general orders. LU 399 and Reso 947, Lenox Avenue Cluster. Coupled on general orders. LU 400 and Reso 948 through LU 402 and Reso 950, Amsterdam a Avenue. Coupled on general orders. LU, LU 400 and Reso 948 through LU 402 and Reso 950, Amsterdam Ap Avenue. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to section 197D of the New York City Charter. Excuse me, LU 415 and Reso 951, JFK North Site. Couple of general orders. LU 416 and Reso 952, and LU 417 and Reso 953, Manhattanville Walkway. Couple of general orders. LU 418 and Reso 954, Brownsville North. Couple of general orders. LU 420 through LU 437 on page 11, Special Bay Street, Brook 156, and Howard Avenue rezoning. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to section 197D of the New York City Charter. Preconsidered LU 459 and Reso 955 through preconsidered LU 462 and Reso 958 school facilities. Coupled to general orders. Report of the committee on rules, privileges, and elections. Preconsidered Reso 959 changes to committees and subcommittees. Coupled on general orders. Report of the committee on state and federal legislation. Preconsidered SLR 2 through SLR 12, various home rule messages. Couple of general orders. On the general order calendar, resolution appointing various persons, commissioner of deeds. Couple of general orders, and at this time, I'll ask for a roll call vote on all of the items on today's general order calendar. Adams. Aye on all. Ampri Samuel. Aye on all. Ayala. Aye on all. Barron. I vote aye on all. Borelli. I and all except 732B, 1114A, 1340, 1370, and SLR5. Brannon. Aye. Cabrera. Permission to explain my vote. Permission granted. Thank you so much. I want to take a moment to congratulate uh, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Bain Kalos, introduction 732 which will establish a full public match campaign finance system. Let me speak from a personal note. Ten years, ten years ago, I ran for office. I had never ran for office. Uh, and I was exposed to the campaign finance system in which many of us here participated and benefit from. And even back then, I asked myself, why don't we have a full matching system. Communities like mine were economically disadvantaged. It's imperative that we have such a system. It's imperative that we have a full matching program to be able to help those who otherwise would have been in a disadvantage with somebody who comes in who has a network of people who got deep, deep, deep pockets. This is going to put everyone in, a, in, in, in an even kill and, and give accessibility to those who otherwise had not even contemplated a running. I, I believe this is a big win for uh, democracy uh, today, and it's a superior, it's the, the, the most superior matching program that I have seen in the nation. Uh, and so with that, I'm proud to vote aye on all. Matteo. No one 732, 1340, 1370, 1114, SLR5, I and the rest. Chin. I and all. Cohen. Aye. Constantinides. 
Ayano. Cornegie. Arnold. Deutsch. Uh, no on intro 1114A and no on SLR5. And I the rest. Diaz. Permission to spend my vote. Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today I'm voting no on introduction 732A, I mean B, believing that the people of the city of New York already voted for that and ordered us to do that. So there's no reason for us to go against the will of the people. So if we would like to do uh, read on that, the people should, should be the one that should decide it. But the people already voted for that. I'm also voting no on introduction 1114A. I think the history cannot be ch changed. History will end by our mistake on the, in history. And by erasing status, we are not, we're trying to erase history. History is there, good or bad, like it or not, the history and status should be there. I'm also there also on resolution 919, 920, and 924, dealing with abortion as a clergy and people that oppose abortion in all stages. I'm not for that. And SLRA. No, so everything else is yes. Thank you very much. Drum. I am all. Eugene. I vote aye. Gibson. I am all. Joe Nye. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you. Earlier today, I uh, had the uh, privilege to donate blood. And while answering the questions prior to uh, approval, I found it odd that there were certain questions that were asked about my relationship and pertaining to sexual matters with other men. These questions are intended to exclude the gay community from donating blood. I hope that this body will right that wrong where the gay community is isolated and prevented and excluded from donating blood. Mm. With that in mind, I vote aye on all except for intro 732. Gordenchik. Aye. Holden. Aye on all except for intro 1114A and preconsidered SLR5. I vote no. SLR5. What's that? Kalos. Aye and all. Ku. Aye. Kozlowitz. May I be excused to explain my vote? Mission granted. I would like to congratulate Peter Ku on his chairmanship of parks and to Robert Holden on his chairmanship of technology. Congratulations. <clears throat> also, I would like to say I'm going to miss Elizabeth Guzman. She was the counsel to my committee on rules and I know she's leaving and she's going across the street and certainly I will call you. And I want to welcome Lance, who will be part of the committee. Welcome Lance and I look forward to working with you. And with that I vote aye on all. Lander. Request permission to explain my vote. Permission granted. Thank you, I vote aye on all. Um, I am a proud co-sponsor of intro 732B by Councilmember Kalos, and I was the second sponsor on it last term when it was first introduced. To me, I think about it like this. Every time somebody who's running for office sits down to make their next call, to raise their next contribution, do you want them to have an incentive to call a regular New Yorker, 
or do you want them to have an incentive to call a wealthy New Yorker, likely with some special interest in the system? Right now, because there's a gap in what you can raise through public match, there's a point in time at which that person has an incentive to raise large dollar, and this bill changes that by making it possible for every contribution to be matched. Every time you sit down to raise, you can raise it from a regular New Yorker, and that is good government, and it gives people confidence in the system. It is an investment in good government, not an investment in us. I do also appreciate Councilmember Kalos's clarification that this does not cover money which is rolled over from prior cycles, which I think is important. Um, and with that, I'll be voting aye on all. Levin. I vote aye on all. Levine. Aye on all. Lewis. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Uh, today being my first day and the first opportunity that I saw the agenda, um, I just want to let you all know that I'm voting I on all except all LUs on land use on the land use calendar for which I abstain. Thank you. Mizell. Yes. Menchaca. I on all. Miller. I'm going to abstain on 732 and I vote I on all res. Moya. I and all. Perkins. Powers. I and all. I want to congratulate both uh, Councilmember Koo and Councilmember Holden on their new committee chairs. Reynoso. I vote I and all. Rivera. I and all, and congrats to my colleagues. Rose. I and all. Rosenthal. I and all. Torres. I and all. Traeger. Aye. Ulrich. I vote aye on all with the exception of intro 732B, intro 111, I'm sorry, 1114A, and a pre-considered SLR 5. Valone. Aye on all with the exception of 1114A. Van Bramer. Permission to briefly explain my vote. Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, Councilmember Inez Barron on uh, this bill. I think it's uh, long overdue, and I know uh, she cares deeply and passionately about it, as do I, which is why I was proud to be a co-sponsor. Uh, so uh, I just want to thank her for her persistence in, in leading the charge to make sure that we uh, right uh, the wrongs and uh, set forth a better policy uh, when the City of New York seeks to honor uh, people. So with that, I am very proud to vote aye on all. Jaeger. May I be excused to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first, uh, on introduction uh, 799, Mr. President, I'm uh, proud to be a co-sponsor with you on this. I'm proud to have signed on early and to be your second co-sponsor. Um, uh, requesting a reasonable accommodation should always be protected. It should never be uh, something that could be retaliated against. And uh, uh, you had great vision in introducing this and putting this fix into the statute. And I congratulate you, sir. Thank you. Um, I, uh, well, folks here know where I stand on uh, introduction 732. Um, I truly don't know what I tell the next senior citizen who tells me that her real property tax bill went up, even though I swear on my life and everybody in this chamber swears on their lives that we have nothing to do with their bill going up, but it goes up every year. Um, I guess we can tell them that uh, don't worry about it. Your money's going to a good cause, and uh, we can tell them where. Uh, I will vote aye on all, with the exception of 1114, 732, SLR 5, and I abstain on Resolution 959, SLR 2, SLR 3, SLR 6, SLR 7, SLR 8, SLR 10. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Rodriguez. Aye. Speaker Johnson. We are just going to take a few minutes to tally the vote. Appreciate your patience.
have a we have a request from our uh, BLAC and those who will be speaking in general order. Uh, please keep in mind that the BLAC has an um, important meeting after and requesting that you. I'm sure uh, as a lot of people are requesting to keep remarks short. I just want to reiterate that. I know that for the BLAC members, the police commissioners in the committee room, so we have to maintain a quorum to get through this. Uh, so we may want to move quickly because I think the police commissioner has to be out in 35 minutes. So we may want to move quickly for the caucus members. Okay, all of the items on today's general order calendar. Yes. All items on today's general order calendar are adopted by a vote of 48 in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, with the exceptions of land use 398 through 402, 415 through 418 and 459 through 462 with accompanying resos, which is adopted by a vote of 47 in affirmative, zero in a negative, and one abstention. And in show 1114A, which was adopted by a vote of 40 in affirmative, eight in negative, and zero abstentions. And in show 732B, which was adopted by a vote of 41 in affirmative, six in a negative, and one abstention. And in show 1340A, which was adopted by a vote of 46 in the affirmative, two in the negative, and zero abstentions, and intro 1378, which is adopted by a vote of 46 in the affirmative, two in the negative, zero abstentions, and SLR 5, which is adopted by a vote of 42 in the affirmative, six in the negative, and zero abstentions, and SLR 8, which is adopted by a vote of 46 in the affirmative, one in the negative, and one abstention, and SLR 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, and zero, which is adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, one abstention, the revised land use call-ups vote is 48 in affirmative, zero in the negative. Now I have introduction and reading of the bills. All bills have been referred to committee as indicated on the agenda, and because, Mr. Public Advocate, I know there are no resolutions today, we don't need to maintain quorum. Now that the vote has been read, so if there are members of the BLAC that want to leave and go next door, you're more than willing to do so, uh, and uh, back to you. SLR 8 revised vote, which is adopted by a vote of 46 in affirmative, one in a negative, and one abstention. Thank you, and we'll now move into general discussions. First, uh, Councilmember Barron, before she leaves, wants to take her moment. If not, we'll go to, is she here? Councilmember Kalos. Let's kill all the zombie committees, give war chests back to the taxpayers, and make elections more competitive. Uh, incumbents should not need a war chest. The best protection comes from working hard and doing your job. Millions of dollars lie dormant in political Close accounts. Can be quiet. Quiet, please. Quiet. Millions of dollars lie dormant in political accounts that are amassed in war chests by incumbents and former elected officials, often with the goal to scare away and defeat challengers. These accounts remain like zombies as a personal ping peggy bank for term-limited, disgraced, and even deceased politicians 
who have long since lost office. This money should be returned when the campaigns close following each election. Today, I'm pleased to introduce introduction 1601, which I hope you will sign on to. And uh, this would be moving forward. I hope to have your support. Uh, thank you. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Intro 1584, which I encourage my colleagues to sign on to. This bill will require this bill will require annual financial disclosure from each person who has interest in any taxicab license. Over the past few years, we have all become aware of the struggle and overwhelming debt of taxi medallion owners. Taxi medallions have become a money pit for thousands of drivers. It's time that we mandate this reporting to get a handle on this unregulated sector that has allowed the predatory exploitation of hardworking drivers. Intro 1584 will help root out bad actors and give way to the oversight that should have been in place all along. I thank Speaker Johnson, Councilmember Torres for this great package of legislation that I am proud to be a part of. In addition, I am proud to join the Women's Caucus in an effort to enhance the existing protections for reproductive health in New York by introducing Reso 918, which calls for the New York State to expand coverage for health care services to individuals whose immigration status renders them ineligible for federal financial participation. After years of fighting for essential protections for women, it is outrageous that women's reproductive rights are under national attack. I stand with the women of the New York City Council to demand respect for women and protection for the basic right of all women to make health care decisions. And I ask my colleagues to support Intro 1584 and Reso 918 by signing on to this valuable legislation. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Thank you so much, uh, and just uh, my personal privilege again, as a Brooklynite and hip hop fan, I'd be remiss if I didn't raise the name of Richard Stephen Shaw, who passed away this week at 52. His stage name was Bushwick Bill. Uh, he spoke uh, a lot of issues as a member of the Ghetto Boys, and he spoke a lot about his own issues uh, of attempting suicide. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to now call on the speaker. I'd like to now call on the speaker to recess today's meeting. The stated meeting of June 13, 2019 stands in recess.